see they want to check and see what and now now they're going to find out what I really say. Isn't Tim wonderful? <laughs> Most precious pastor you've ever had. <laughs> okay. All those kind of things. Okay. Let's get to it. Um, the book of Romans, I believe, is one of the pinnacle books of the New Testament. I say pinnacle is like the high point. Uh, it comes right after the Gospels. You have book of Acts. You have Romans. Romans then introduces all the epistles written by Paul the Apostle. It is one that really, uh, rightfully, he, he gives such profound insight to human nature and the needs of human mankind. And, and it is also a prophetical book uh, in, in many ways. There's much mention of prophecy, of understanding from Genesis to Revelation, whether they realize it, 40% uh, of the Bible is prophecy. I, I, really, honest to goodness, 40% is prophecy. It'll tell you prophecy about man, and mankind tell you, let me tell you what man is like. Let me tell you about the nature of man. That's prophetic. And all the way to the second coming of Christ, the first coming of Christ, when, where, how he'd be born. Those are things that nobody could know except God. Has we somebody that can see the future. You and I can't see future. You and I can only see now in the past. But you haven't a clue about tomorrow. You can make all the plans you want about tomorrow. But you don't know about tomorrow. But God does. And there's certain things he does reveal to us that are prophetical things. A prophecy of nature and judgment and the coming and, and last days and, and the des description of the last days and the end times. And some of the verses I put up here, I did for a purpose. I'm going to read some of these. I'm going to do them quickly. You can listen along, but I put them so you can write them down and you can read them for yourself. And I want to go to first one is in the second Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 5 through 10. And tells us there, do, not re do you not remember that I was, when I was still with you, that I told you these things? You know that what is restraining him, the Lord, the Holy Spirit, now so that he may be revealed at his time? For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Do you notice that today? There's, it's, it's almost mysterious. It's how can this world be so out of control, so out of law, out of law outside of bounds, it's craziness going on. I, read, I saw this morning um, a quote from John McCain and John Kerry. Now, John McCain's kind of more of the liberal side of the Republicans. John Kerry is our Secretary of State, all right? A couple of guys that, you know, and they both agreed to this statement and said this together. We have never seen a world that is in more turmoil than now. That was said yesterday by those two men. We have never seen a world in more turmoil than it is now. Well, as, as he goes in, in, in Thessalonians, he goes on, he says, the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is out of the way. Until God is out of the way, man, this place is really going to go crazy. You think it's crazy now? Wait until the Lord takes his people out. Woo! And then he goes on and he says, and then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with, uh, with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing at the appearance of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders. We live in a strange day. You know, when we think about some of the things that are happening and we read in the polls, what is the most important issues of life? Well, I was reading in some of the polls, and I was looking up different polls that are out, ABC, NBC, you know, and Fox News, and everybody else that has polls. What are the really issues that you're really concerned about in life? Well, the issues came up, well, one of the number one is um, economy. The economy is not doing well, although the stock market's never been higher. 17,100 and you know, something or other this week. Never been higher. You, don't, you do understand, though. That's all just paper. It's all paper. And the book of Revelation says in one hour, it'll crash. It says, reading Revelation, in one hour, it can crash. Well, it's really crazy. We have economy that, that people are searching for good jobs and can't. Our price of our bacon is $5.99 if you want good bacon, you know. 
And if you want to get an English muffin anymore, I, you know, me and my English muffins, you know, and now they're $1.75, you know, unless you can get them on sale, yeah. And people say, hey, you can get such and such for two bucks now, you know. English, Thomas English are on sale. You think, crazy. They used to be for 79 cents, you know. We live in an economy where we're not, our income's not going up, but everything else is, right? You feel it. You know it. Well, that's the number one. You know what else is a big concern? Values. I thought that was interesting. That's one of the real major concerns of values in, in America ha, are changing, and people are concerned about it. And also is uh, the vision for the future. 29% are concerned about the future of America. Economy being number one. Immigration, anywhere from 10% to 17% are starting to get really concerned about the immigration issues that are happening. And, and then big government and health and care. 19% are, think that's the number one. Those are some of the concerns about this lawless day that we're living in. But let me read another one. In 2 Timothy, it says this. In 2 Timothy, in chapter 3, it says this. In the last days, it tells us a little bit more. Paul's writing. But understand this, that in the last days, there will come times of difficulty. Mm? Amen? Yeah. For people will be, and it gives a description of this society of the last day. Lovers of self, lovers of money. Proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient, ungrateful, unholy, heartless. Wow. You read some of the things that are happening over there in, uh, in Iraq and, I, and uh, what are happening in, with the ISIS. We're going to talk a little bit about that tonight and what they're doing. How about Mosul? 60,000 Christians have been chased out of Mosul in the last uh, month. And that's not on the news. They don't talk about that much. And we'll talk about that later. Heartless, unappeasable, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having an appearance of godliness, but, but, but denying its power. That's a picture of what the last days would be like. But then the real, the real kicker is when you turn to Re Revelation, and you know that one, the mystery of not only a lost character, but the mystery of the 666. And I've preached messages on that, and I won't do that this morning, but I just want to remind you about it. And it says there in verse 16 through 18 about this beast that's going to come, this Antichrist. And he says, and it, it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or forehead so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark. That is the name of the beast or the number of its name. This, this calls for wisdom. Let, let no one who, let, excuse me, let the one who understands calculate this for the beast, for it is the number of a man as the number is, 666. Well, there's many things that we have, we have, uh, suppose that possibly this might be and what he's trying to say there and it'll be revealed more as time goes on i believe as we get closer we see it clearer and clearer and clearer that there's some system that's going to come that's going to control man because why because we've gone lawless and there has to be somebody come in and take over because we're losing control america do doesn't is losing control the world's losing control nations are gathering for good and for bad. European Union, the United States, the Asian market, they're all trying to gather so they can try to be stable and try to hang in there. Russia's trying to get a federation together and trying to seize what they can. And what, what, what ambition do they have? Why are they trying to come down from the, from the north? Why are they heading south? Well, I read Ezekiel, I know. Uh, you know. I know where they're headed eventually because the Bible says, I will put a hook in his jaw and Russia will come down against Israel. Why would they come against Israel? Because Israel has the, 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 the largest deposit of natural gas in the entire world. They have over one trillion cubic foot of natural gas that they have discovered in the last five years. And they are now pumping it and piping it. And they plan to sell it at a third of the value, a uh, third of the price of what Russia sells their natural gas to all of Europe. That's a threat to Russia. I, I mentioned these things. The economic turmoil, 
economic in terms of you can't keep your identity. You're always got to you got to list with some company for identity theft and whatnot. Try to protect your credit cards. Always checking this and that and everything because somebody's going to steal it. That's a constant problem. And there's a need somehow that we got to have some sort of system that will come over and grab hold universally because we are so international now. We're not we're not independent nation anymore, all by ourselves, you know. And and and, and we're world connected. And that, that brings us to the dollar. The dollar is weakened, and Russia doesn't want to use the dollar. China is trying to move you in that we have a whole new international money. U European Union wants to have you know, the euro as the, as the world money market. And the dollar has gotten weaker and losing its influence. It's no longer accepted by everybody as the standard. And so we have two issues, and one is, is identification, and the second one is control. And that antichrist, of when I read Revelation, wants to do those two things. Is we can identify everybody somehow because a card just isn't working anymore, right? And so if we can implant, you know, the RFIDs and all those kind of things, and we have that it's a system that works, it's awesome. I go into my doctor's office, I sit down. I don't, they don't have to put anything on me. I'm just in the room, and up flashes on the screen, Glenn Stern at all the information about Glenn Stern from that little RFID that's inside me here. That, that, that pacer has all the information of my history and everything recorded. The new ones, they're awesome. This is my second one, and it's awesome. I, I read it on the screen, I said, man, you know that, and you haven't even touched me. He said, no, you just came with so many feet, and we got you. We got everything about you. I can go in the hospital and they can do the same thing right there. They just turn up the right thing and bingo, they got all the information about me. Isn't it amazing what we can do? Same with this one. I make a little chip in it and say, hey, we can mark you, Jody, and we'll know everything about you, who you are and your identification. We can mark you, Ed, and we'll have, well, wouldn't this be good? Nobody can steal your identification. And the second thing that it'll do is not give you ID, but it'll give control. I also know where you are. Funny thing is, they kind of know where I am, <laughs> you know. But they also know where my phone. Yeah, you know, I know where I am too. They know where you are too. I mean, isn't it amazing? Technology that you know, when 25 and 30 years ago, when I would preach about the coming of Christ and some of these things, I, I, I just say I don't understand it. I just believe it. But now I'm living in it, and I see it, and I see it happening. I see how we're how we're a part of that. And there's so many other things I could go on. Look at that also is the third thing about it is, is that spiritual class. You see what it said there in Timothy when it says, they'll be lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power of it. Churches are changing. Churches are changing. People are changing. People are more concerned about themselves and, the, and their image and everything else than they are about the Savior and worship and praise to him. And what's happened over the last gener several generations, you know, but especially after the last, say, 30 years, and, 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 and for me, and, and, and I've been in ministry for 40 years enough to see and watch churches, it's amazing to see how they've changed. In the mid-60s, to the now uh, 2014, the United Church of Christ went from, uh, 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 has lost 44% of its churches and attendance. Episcopals went from 3.4 3. 4 million down to less than 2 million. Presbyterians went from 4.25 million down to 1.8 million. Methodists have lost half, 50%. And many, many other churches, same kind of story. Why? What happened? Why is it so many churches are dying through all those years? And yet, at the same time, you'll find that there are. There's this funny little balance that's weird that's going on. There are those churches that do big programs with no message, no real gospel message, and just do a lot of splash, and they're growing. And then there's also those that are of uh, more conservative, that are contemporary, and charismatic. And charismatic doesn't mean tongues. Charismatic means they're just more alive. Okay, the, the spirit of God just really working, at, and those are growing, at, at an astounding rate, growing really awesomely. 
So it's brought us to, in our church, and through the last, and Pastor Tim and I have done a lot, and it's, it's mish, mishology. And what that is, is it's a term that's being used now in the study of, of uh, what is happening, what is, what is the mission of the church, what is, what is really our statement, where are we going? Investigating the mandate and the mission of the church's purpose. That's why we came up then just recently here, and just this has taken process of many months, of saying, okay, what is our purpose? Our purpose statement is what? Whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. That's a good statement. Do you know where that's found? First Corinthians 10, 31. Good for you. And about a week from now, you're going to see it in big letters right in front in the in the uh, foyer when you come in. It's going to be a message right in front of you all the time. Whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Why? Because that's the real issue of life. That's where we really come. And what I find in the book of Romans in chapter 10 here is this, is that Paul says there's three, th three things. First of all, we need to be saved. In verse 1, he says, said, Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer for, to God is to them that they might be saved. And he goes on, he says, For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge, for being ignorant for the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness for everyone who believes. Paul the Apostle, and there's so many things, and I preached once already on this one passage. I'm picking out the parts that I did not preach on in it. And that is, first of all, this point is this, is that he had a, such a burden and a passion like Jesus. You've got to know, you've got to be saved. You must be saved. Jesus said what? You must be marvel not by saying to you, you must, you must be what? Born again. And, and Nicodemus was saying, well, I've been born. What do you mean? It's like I go through my mother's womb a second time. I have to have reincarnation. Is that how it? No, 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 you don't get it. There is physical birth and then there's spiritual birth. Spiritually, you're dead, man. Spiritually, you're going nowhere. You got nothing. If you don't think so, just look at your life. Look at the world around you. It's spiritually dead. It's not tuned to God. It's not bringing glory to God. It's bringing glory to man. Doing everything for himself. Where does it get you? Oh, I'm in trouble. Well, I try to do the right thing. I try to do this and that. Well, I tell you what, you can try all you want, but it takes the power of God to change the heart, to want to do the right and want to do the good. I was, I was reading a, a, another survey. I like to read surveys, I guess, you know, and this was a Christian survey and doing an they did over like, I don't know how many thousand it was, but it was a large number and, uh, of Americans. And they came up with there's three kinds of Christian. Now, uh, the survey itself uh, had more to say about is that statistically, did you know that there's only 1.8% that are atheists in America? By all the news, you'd think that must be 30%, you know, but it's only 1.8% of America is atheists. Uh, also is a 2.4% are agnostic. Now, agnostic, I like to witness to. They're a lot of fun. The atheists, they, they're just, they just don't want to talk about it. Agnostic, you know, they, they try to play the middle ground of, well, I don't know, you know, I really think, you know. That's not, well, you, you do realize what you mean is you don't know, so I'd like to tell you. Well, no, what do you mean, you know? You know, well, I have this belief is, well, well agnostic means no knowledge. Agnostic, no Gnostic knowledge. That's what the word means. Oh, you don't know anything. So I'd like to tell you something. You know, there is a God. And there, is, there is something that, that is very important about this. We did come from somewhere. We didn't just happen to be. Well, I'm not an atheist. They'll say, you know, okay, then there's a God. Well, I'm not sure there's a God. You know, they try to play this middle ground, you know. Well, there's only really 2.4% in America. Then there's 21% of America that is... A multitude of cults and Islam and Buddhists and, and all sorts of New Age and everything else. You know, it's, that's quite a large number, really, 21%. They believe something way somewhere off, okay? 76% are claiming to be Christian, 75.7. 70, so, so let's just say 75%. 
75%. Well, that really sounds awesome. Sounds like we're a Christian nation. But now you got to break it down. What is a Christian? And in doing so, you start breaking it up. There's three kinds. And number one is there's cultural Christians. They don't see the need to be saved. Cultural Christians are this, you see, they have zeal without knowledge. They're kind of what Paul the Apostle says is kind of like a Jew. You know, well, of course I'm a Jew, so I, I'm, a, I'm, yeah, I'm one of God's people. You know? That doesn't mean a thing. A Jew that says he's a Jew doesn't mean he's really devoted, doesn't mean he's very religious or righteous or anything else. He's just claiming the name because he wants to distinguish himself from being a Gentile. Well, in the same way, there's those that you go into the hospital or somewhere and say, well, uh, wh what faith do you claim? Uh, Christian. I don't want to be called a Muslim. I don't want to be called atheist or anything else. So mark me Christian. And that's literally what there is. 25% of Americans are really cultural Christians because they live in America that is cultural based on Christianity. Our moral system, our, our fiber was based that way. That's who they are. They, they acknowledge that, you know, that the, there's a God and, and it all and everything else, but, and they're not perfect or anything, but they're not really smart enough to do anything about it. They just kind of leave it at that. Sure, we need to be kind to each other and patient and do all that, you know, but, uh, but yeah, I don't, I'm not desperately wicked or anything like that. I'm really a pretty good guy. I'm really, I'm really all right. They do not believe Jeremiah 17, 9, that says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. And the one thing I know more than anything else, Christian, if you've really gotten in tune with yourself, you know your heart is very wicked. And it's only by the grace of God that there's any holiness or righteousness at all. Because it'll think the most devious things at times in our life, deep down inside. You know, it, takes, it, it does take the power of God to do different. Paul calls that godly knowledge, to know the creator, to come to maturity, that he is righteous and I am not. And you are created for his glory and for his purpose. And we have been called to him for a purpose in life. Culture Christians, they, they, they just simply, they believe, yeah, there's a God. I'm not atheist. I'm not a Buddhist. I'm anything. I'm, I'm Christian. They don't really see the need to be saved. Now, then there's a second point, and it's this. We need, Paul says, we need to be righteous. In verses Three and following, he talks about that in verse three, for being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they do not submit to God's righteousness. And you read on through the rest of the verses, I won't take the time. There is a second group in America, and it's 25% equal, 25% that are congregational Christians. Now, now by definition, of what is a congregational Christian? Well, you know, they realize that there is a need. They realize that there is a need basic in the heart. They realize that I, I'm, I'm a sinner. They realize that when they're a little boy, nobody ever had to teach them to be a sinner. They just sinned. Yeah, amen? Mm, Y'all yeah, with me? Mommy and daddy never taught you. You knew how to do it all by yourself. You know, if you, you, know you figured it out. I mean, there is that whole group. There's 25% of America. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says this, and they... They have come to realize this. For our sake, he made them to be made, excuse me. He made them to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. They have come to realize that I am not righteous, I am unclean, and I need to be clean, and I want to be clean. I need God's righteousness. Simply put, there's man's righteousness. There's God's righteousness. And sometimes we think we can manufacture righteousness. We can't. Righteousness is purely from God. It only comes from God. You see, 
man's rising and says this, I'm okay, I'm, I'm going to church now, and I've been there four weeks in a row, and, you know, I just, you, you just have to accept me for what I am. I do have my quirks, you know, don't we all have a little quirk? You know, you're all a little bit quirky. You know, we're all a little bit off. Uh, I mean, none of us are perfect, you know, right? Amen. Woo. Okay, all right, I mean, we all have our little, and, and, and there is that part. And then there's, there's God's righteousness, and God's righteousness says this, oh, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Because you do these things, and because you're trying to be so good, does that, think, does that make you think you've got my righteousness upon you? That somehow I have poured out upon you for that? He says, all have sinned, all have come short of the glory of God. The glory of God. I've been studying this week, or in a couple of weeks I'm going to preach again, and I, I want to preach on this whole idea. Whatever we do, we do to the glory of God. What does it mean, glory of God? And how many times glory to God is mentioned in the Bible? It's amazing and how God talks about that. And one of the things he says, you have come short of what? The glory of God. You have come short of honoring God. Your sin is dishonoring to God, dishonoring to what he created you for. You've been created for his glory. Man is bankrupt. He's broke. He's short. He has double standards. He's proudful. He's hypocritical. He's impatient. He's, yeah, you go on and on and on. A congregational Christian is one of those who, who knows that there is a sin issue. He knows the Jesus story. He knows the cross story. He knows the resurrection story. He just wants fire insurance, okay, and just wants a good life and just leave me alone. I don't want to be too extreme. I don't want to be crazy religious or anything or, or you know, get, I just want enough to get me by. You know people like that? Just enough to get me by. You know, if I, as long as I get through the pearly gates, that's all I need, right? Well, then there's a number three. Number three is we need to get to real. There's a third group of Christians, and that is convictional Christians. You see, there's the cultural ones that just culturally is, you know, because they live in America, they are Christians. They're congregational ones. That's the ones that they go to church once in a while, you know, and I'll just kind of appease themselves and feel like, gee, I'm pretty good. I go to church, yes, I've been to church twice before. And then there is this third group, convictional, convictional. Now, now in this one, Paul gets down to the real issues of life, and that's in verse 9. And he says, I'll, I'll back up to verse 8. But what does it say? The word is near. The answer is near right now. It's the answer is right near. Folks, you want righteousness? It's right here. That's what he means when he says, the word is near, in your mouth, in your heart. It's that close. People think that to reach God and reach out and attain that righteousness is so far to attain. It's so hard. I don't understand it. I just can't. He says, no, it's so near. It's right beside you. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Wow. And he, he makes a statement here that's so, you've got to get real. Paul gets down to the real issue of life. Who's Lord in your life? Who runs the show in your life? Who's in charge in your life? What do you live for anyway? What, do you, what would you die for? Is there anything that you died for? Have you ever performed Romans 12, 1 and 2? I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present yourselves a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. Have you ever done that? Have you ever come to that point in your life that you said, Jesus, here I am on the altar. I belong to you. And everything in the future now from this day on belongs to you. I'm yours. That's convictional Christianity. A little different from cultural Christians do. Doesn't look it that way. A little different from the congregational Christians. Doesn't look the same way. You see, this is a little too radical, you know, a little too committed, you know. This, I mean, 
I said, really? Is this something new? All the way back to the book of Genesis. And he came to Abraham and said, Abraham, will you follow me? I'm going to leave everything I have. Now that was radical. Where am I going? I'll tell you later. Wow. That's putting God on notice. To the disciples. And he came down to them and they're fishing in the Sea of Galilee. And he says, hey, guys, will you drop the nets and follow me? Come on. And it says, and they dropped their nets and they followed him. Was that kind of radical? I mean, I mean, now, I mean, I've got obligations. You know, I've got credit cards and bills and I've got this and that. And I've got a home and I've got this. Can you imagine some of the things that are going through and racing through their mind? What would be racing through your mind? Yeah, yet that's what Jesus did. This is nothing new when he says, I want you to commit everything to him. Everything to him. To the glory of God. Wow. Have you confessed him? Now see, this is, Christi this is convictional Christianity. Not merely believing that he is who he says he is. The demons can do that. They believe in God. James 2.19, and they tremble. <laughs> we don't have sense enough to tremble. <laughs> but to confess means, the word when he says, but if you confess him, the word confess means to come in agreement with. Well, come in agreement with what? Confess him that Jesus is Lord. Have you come into agreement, Jesus, your Lord? Does that make sense now? You see, you see what he's saying there? It's, it's, it's a powerful statement. Paul, the apostle, gets to a real issue of life right here. Jesus is Lord. And believe, believe what? In your heart, in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Wow. Really? Well, I'm not sure about the resurrection. I mean, that's just my guess. <laughs> I've never seen anything like that. Because he's never seen it. I can't believe it. I can't see the air, but I keep breathing it. Mm. Just try stopping that for a while, okay? See how long you last. I mean, there's a lot of things I can't see that I do believe in. But it's the results of them that I see. I see that what, it, what difference it makes if I believe it. In the book in 1 Corinthians 15, 14 through 17, Paul the Apostle brings a conclusion there. And he says, listen, that without the resurrection... He says, Christ is not raised, then our preaching is in vain. Our testimony is empty. Our faith is futile. Life is hopeless. And you are the most pitiful people that there is in the world. Now, you think about it. That is really true. You've got nothing, is what he says, without the resurrection. And so back here in Romans, he says, listen, you want the heart of surrender to Jesus Christ? You want to understand what it means to be a convictional Christian? It is this, to believe God raised him from the dead. Because if God can raise him from the dead, then he can do anything. Then he can forgive you of your sin, all sin. Then he can raise you from the dead. Then he can give you power to live the Christian life. Then he can change your heart when you sin. Then he can give you joy when there's sorrow. And he can give you purpose when you've lost hope. You see, and it all starts with this. Otherwise, he's dead and he can't do anything. He has nothing to offer. Do you believe that to win the world is not to become more like the world, but is to be countercultural, being different from the world? It, is, it means to, 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 to have a deep commitment to a lifestyle that is not unto the world's standard, but to God's standard. It is to be clean. A commitment to say, I want to be clean. I want to be holy. I want to be pure. I want to be humble. I want to be grateful. It is, a, it is a life that says, I want to renew daily my commitment that you are Lord. Good morning, Lord. You're still Lord today. I pronounce you Lord for this day. I want to rely on the Holy Spirit to empower me, to use me. Lord, use me today any way that I can. I can touch somebody here today. Does that make a difference to anybody today? That's what life looks like. 
You see, he goes on. He says, now I want to live my life as an offering, an offering to him. Do you ever think about it? What, what made the difference in the first century Christian? Well, they believed that sin was a real issue. Do you believe sin is a real issue? I do. Sin is around us all wearing it. It starts right here. The second thing is they believed Jesus was an answer to the sin issue. That when he died on the cross, it's not just a symbol. It's something to remind me that his blood was shed because I needed it. I needed that shedding. I needed that forgiveness. And that his promise of eternal life is a sure thing. That I re by receiving him, I, I receive eternal life. And they believed so strongly, they were willing to die for what they believed. And they did, many in the first century. But the point is, for us, is not so much whether they're willing to die. There's some people around the world right now in Mosul, I'll share tonight, the things that have the, been said, wow, to them it's amazing. But for us, it's not a matter of whether you're willing to die for him. Are you willing to live for him? Are you willing to live for him? Are you willing to live for him? As we bow before the Lord, is there anyone here? You say, I want to be a convictional Christian. I want a deeper commitment to my Lord and my Savior. I want to be clean. I want to be humbled. I need to renew daily my commitment that he is Lord. I need to rely on the Holy Spirit to empower and to use me. I want to offer myself a fresh offering to him. Would you just slip your hand up and say, yes, that's me. I want that. Yeah, yeah, I see that. Yes, yeah, anyone else? Yes. Okay, okay. Is there anyone that would say, I want to surrender my life to him. I never have before. I want to today, begin today, saying, Jesus, you are Lord. Would you raise your hand? Is there anyone? All right. Lord, we pray right now. All of us are bowed before you in a holy place in your, your house. And we're offering afresh. And for each one of us, it's a little bit different. For some of us, we're saying, Lord, I, I want to live my life, a lifestyle that's honoring to you. I want to be clean. I want to be humble, grateful. I want to renew daily. I'm going to make a commitment to every day, just renew my commitment to you. You are Lord. I need to rely on the Holy Spirit. I want to offer myself afresh. Here I am, Lord. Take me, use me. Whatever I do, I want to do for your glory and not for mine. I want to honor you. Thank you. Thank you for hearing our prayer.